Hi, I'm Teddy, and I'm eight. I want to start a revolution. And you're listening to Lauren Duca on Two Broads Talking Politics. Bye bye. everyone. This is Kelly with Two Broads Talking Politics, part of the Demcast Podcast Network. I'm on with my co-host, Sophie. Hey, Sophie. Hey, Kelly. And joining us today is Lauren Duca, who is the author of a new book, How to Start a Revolution, Young People and the Future of American Politics. Hi, Lauren. Hello. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, so, I think your name is probably one that's familiar to a lot of people, but they might not know a lot about how you got started in writing about politics. So could you give us just a sort of the the brief version of uh, how you found yourself writing about politics? Yeah, so I was working as an entertainment reporter and was kind of, you know, doing work that was political in the sense that it investigated cultural hierarchies, but I still... I didn't really have this connection to agency that is concrete and out of the abstract in terms of influencing the government structures that affect our lives. So I was doing political work that was focused on feminism and interested in empowering people with information about who we are and how we spend our time and energy, except it was yeah, it was disconnected from um, that, that sense of, of self-determination in terms of really being able to affect change. And when Trump won, I was completely shocked. I know I'm far from alone in that. Yeah. And for me, it was about how absurd all of the things I just accepted as true turned out to be, uh, you know, the way in which I had just been accepting the authority of the the men in suits who talk about politics, you know, just the the the, the media most of all hit me, but 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 the whole system in its entirety, because we were told that this was not going to happen. And I mean, you know, there's probably some people who still have low grade PTSD from watching that New York Times election needle. Like it was just completely and totally impossible until it became reality. And that that's what really shook me. I mean, I was working at the Huffington Post right up until the time when they decided to file Trump's campaign under the entertainment vertical. I mean, it's just, uh, and the thing is that I was part of that newsroom. And so even just, even the way the rules were handed down by literal people who made human decisions, it just, what, what was, what clicked for me was the the illusion of it all. And I've since learned how to articulate all of it in, in much better detail than I was capable of when I was sputtering awake on November 9th, 2016. But anyway, in, in, in this, in this extreme shift in perspective, I said, okay, I, I can't, I don't know what the heck I was trying to do pop culture anthropology and like sitting back and being like, who are we? And <laughs> what do we mean? And, and I was like, holy shit, the world's on fire. So I wrote this uh, book proposal. You know, it's, it's hard to write about politics. You kind of have to be in the club and to get those regular bylines. It's hard to freelance write period. Um, and, you know, it's always feast or famine. And so I, I said, okay, I I believe my greatest skill is writing, and I feel like I need to use my greatest skill to do something about this. And also, I would like to be able to <laughs> pay my rent and have health care. So I'm going to write a book proposal and uh, hopefully, like, shoot my shot. Everyone's going to try and be making sense of this moment. I would like my chance to make sense of this moment. So I wrote this proposal, and the sample chapter was called Donald Trump is Gaslighting America, and that is an article that I eventually published not long after to Teen Vogue. So I was working for Teen Vogue as their weekend editor, and I was covering everything, really kind of basically running the site, Uh, and so there were posts about 
Kylie Jenner's very engaging Snapchat right next to things like the Pulse shooting, which we covered like a breaking news desk. That was always the way that I was trained to write, and I was very dexterous and I, and good for that position because I was able to handle all of that subject matter and and seeing it all as being able to exist in the same space. So it wasn't even, it didn't seem even remotely strange to me to take this essay, Donald Trump is Gaslighting America, and run it on Teen Vogue when then-president-elect Trump contradicted our intelligence agencies for the first time um, and the CIA's uh, information on Russian election interference. And when that piece ran in Teen Vogue, it went massively viral. uh, And it created all of these conversations, not just about how we could better understand the Trump administration's use of disinformation, but also about young women and young people caring about politics. Um, And so it was this really, really wild experience. Like Going viral is kind of it's totally insane. You're just you're just interacting with such a huge mass of human energy that it's just it's like a tidal wave. It's completely and totally insane. And and when it happened, I remember thinking like, okay, like this just I have to get through this and and things will calm down. And like of course <laughs> they they have not done that. And so so it was, I basically decided I need to write about politics. And then a hole opened in the center of the earth and. Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> yes, things have not calmed down. I, I keep thinking that every day. I'm like, tomorrow, everything will be calmer. And no, no, it never happens. <laughs> no. <laughs> we're like, a, we're, we're the, we're, I don't know how many times the frog has been boiled at this point. Like, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the level of intensity just it has only mounted. <laughs> There's no water left in the pot. It's all boiled away. It yeah. <laughs> So in your book, you're talking about young people starting a revolution. So tell me a little bit about what you mean by young people. So to me, young is everything younger than me. I'm 41. So for me, young is a lot of people. Uh, but what? who are the people you're really focused on? Well, you know, I, I guess I would say I'm focused on the public in a way that is it, it should be made maybe clear like, The political awakening that I'm looking at in this book is about this shift from passively navigating a broken system to actively seeking to change it. And it looks like really leveling up in the amount of engagement in society and and civic action that you feel uh, you're qualified for. And it's that that epiphany of political agency is available to anyone, to everyone at any time. Um, But I think it's most significant in terms of the way it's happening for young people for a couple of reasons. Um, So I'm looking at millennials and Gen Z. I think more of my focus is on millennials because millennials will uh, ascend to power sooner. But it's so so the, the idea is really at generational scale, at demographic scale, like when we can talk about cultural, societal factors that will dictate how an entire generation can act. That's why I'm looking at young people, because we are the future and we can lay the groundwork for the people who are even younger than us and shift the paradigm um, in the same way that that the boomers have created the paradigm that um, makes for some of our qualities. So uh, a lot of what I was looking at is the things that – define the millennial generation and Gen Z and the stories we're told uh, about what it means to be young right now. And the stories we're told about what it means to be young right now is that we don't care and we're apathetic and we're narcissistic and we're just like taking selfies and you know, I, you know, we're, we're stingy. That's another, that's a headline I really saw the other day, something about millennials not buying something because we are stingy, which is just... <laughs> Is that before or yeah, after then, your avocado toast? <laughs> I mean, right, right. Like, how about we're all in debt? How about, like, figure it out? It's so obvious. But it's truly, you know, I, I'm frustrated because when everything happened with Teen Vogue, I sort of became this, like, informal spokesperson for young people where it was like, why, why don't you care? Well, okay, what's that based on? Yes. We're not voting as much as we should be voting. Low voter voter turnout statistics are a reality for young people and for the entire polity. But, like, 
what are the reasons for that? I mean, what are the, how are our elected officials working to reach out to us to make this stuff fun and entertaining and accessible to hook our attention in an economy that requires constant hooking of attention, right? Like the aesthetics of Instagram are everywhere. It doesn't require a marketing genius. Basically like anybody who's ever seen a cute subway ad could probably like throw together something in Photoshop that would appeal to, to the Instagram market of millennials and Gen Z. And like, I think that that just at that very obvious aesthetic level is a, plain clue at how it's missing but of course it goes much deeper than that there's just no culpability responsibility for our government officials to expand the electorate not just to the youth but to anyone and then they turn to us and they say why aren't you voting but why the fuck aren't you trying to get us to vote why aren't you giving us the date of the primary never mind the information we need to navigate this election and then also to remain in contact with you you should be you should be doxing yourself elected officials like come on this is just it's 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 infuriating and i think you know we're told we're told that we just don't care it's like we're, we're beaten down we're alienated we're oppressed but we're not apathetic. And in, in, in what, what's happening, I think, is that the youngest generations are kind of clicking out of understanding ourselves as subjects of authority. Um, and so even, it's funny you say, like, you're, you're, you said you're about 40, and so people who are, are younger than you seem different. So for me, right, like, the teens are even younger. And for them, the click moment, I think, is nice and explicit because it looks like we're children, we're students to where self-determined is a much, is a huge obvious shift of you sit and you're, you're in a classroom and you're being spoken to, or you think we're the children and they're the adults. So for younger, the youngest, it's actually even most, most exhilarating. Um, and then the older you are, it's just more about inhabiting that agency. But I, I do think it's something we can talk about changing um, at generational scale. So how do we go about changing it? Like you mentioned needing um, politicians and people in government to be thinking more critically about how they're getting information out to young voters. But like, what can we do? You know, what can listeners do to change that? Well, so, yeah, the, the epiph- it's not so what's changing is that epiphany moment is happening. So my book is a snapshot of the cultural shift that's already underway, and it builds to a call to action. It builds to what I'm already seeing come from this, and I'm hoping to cement it and and offer it to more people. So the the you can you know choose to have this shift. I'm hoping that my book is able to give the awakening to people. I've tried to offer a lot of different click moments. So I'm really good at like funky metaphors and weird anecdotes. So my book basically is telling stories over and over and over again of like concrete examples of the way this is happening and trying to force the awakening to happen for more people. Once the awakening happens, and in my book, I frame this as like, so you're awake. Now what? Well, step one is empower yourself with information. Like it is so, so, so overwhelming right now and chaotic. And it's part of my job to follow the news. And I still, even before this call, was like, crap, what if we talk about impeachment? I don't know if I'm up to date. I haven't read anything since yesterday at 7, so, like, who knows? And <laughs> it's just kind of it's, – it's, it's totally overwhelming, and it's part of my job. So, like, if you're working multiple jobs in a gig economy, like, how are you supposed to make – time for this stuff. I I feel you. And I want to say, you know, no one knows everything. The people who seem like they know everything are pretending, you know, okay, I think that (laughs) there's, there's, there's very few, there's so much performance of expertise, and it's part of what boxes us out. So get your foundation of information. What do you care about? Like, what is the specific issue? And maybe it's really local. Maybe it's, maybe it's something that is, is just about making life a little better in your community. Civic action doesn't have to look like throwing tomatoes at Donald Trump. And it, it, it can be just how are you using your energy to invest in the question of how you live with the people around you and, and how we all live together. So what's the issue that matters most to you? Just become an expert in it. Do your research. We all have Google. Use it. Empower yourself with information. Read a bunch of stuff. Get all of the facts. If you need a media literacy guide, those are available. You know, create a media diet maybe for yourself regularly where you're able to follow local and national news in a way that makes you comfortable. You know, arm yourself with information. Find the style that 
works for you. I'm not, I don't have to tell you how to read. That's step one. And then from there, once you've done your reading, once you've done your work, I, I am telling you with total certainty that that's, that's all that is required of you to be qualified to have a political opinion. And so that's a really big piece of it, I think, is that is the idea that you're qualified, you have permission, you are a political subject who is affected by politics. And once you have your foundation of information, then you have the right to say, this is how I feel about this. This thing is wrong. This thing needs improvement. Um, it's totally fucked that we're all scared. We're going to get shot at the movie theater. You know, whatever your opinion might be, you're right about that. And, and that, like, we're told that so many of these things are, that, that are like meant to be handled by the experts, that, that, the, that, that certain things must just be accepted as the way things are. For example, the lack of solutions on gun reform, which is a total fucking atrocity and should be unacceptable. We're told, well, like, that's how Washington works. Mitch McConnell is um, has to defend his team, so he has to obstruct every reasonable policy solution on not only gun reform but the climate crisis and health care and, oh, refuse to alter – offer any alternatives, and that's just how government works. What the fuck? Like, based on what? And we should all be so furious that, that, that the case is that – that our elected officials feel no need to answer to us in our polit political opinions. And the problem is that a lot of us don't even feel the right to express them. So go ahead, get qualified, get your opinion. And then the third piece is you need to act and you need to decide, you need to decide on something. And I really, you know, I can't, I can't tell you what to do, but I guess three options would be donate. If you have the means, join a protest. If you have the bodily function to make that possible volunteer, if you have the time, you know, it's, the, the options for raising your voice are really kind of limitless, and it's so exciting. I mean, you have to choose, um, but then choose, choose, choose the things that resonate with you. Choose the issues that matter most to you, and then find some activity at, that you can incorporate into your, I would say, daily or weekly schedule, just like going to the gym or brushing your teeth. So basically, all I build to this argument that democracy – uh, needs to be a thing that we do all the time, and that civic action needs to be you know, a, a regular part of who we are, because if we're not participating in that question of how we ought to live together, what the fuck are we even doing? So, so pick the things and make a commitment to them, and yeah, it takes work. Like, if you were like, I'm gonna, I need to start getting in shape now, like, how would you pursue that? You would say, oh, what, type, what type of workout works for me? Like, what kind of body am I trying to get for the summer? Like, you would think about that, and then you would make a plan and like sometimes it would suck to go to the gym and maybe sometimes you wouldn't go to the gym because you had a rough week. It's, it's the same, that metaphor like applies almost perfectly. Like make this, it's a discipline and it's gotta be a daily habit and we all have to do it. And it's daunting because our voices are totally outweighed by moneyed interest. That's the reality of this oppressive system. That's basically an oligarchy in a, in a democracy costume for party city. And I, I feel you, it's daunting. Alienation is not a mistake. But our individual action is is all required to build to the collective power that we need to take this country back. So you went through this awakening moment. I, I think we did as well. We've talked to countless people on this podcast who had, who went through that. But I think a lot about my kids who will never remember the moment before Donald Trump. You know, they're mm -hmm. they're eight and five. And so essentially their entire memory is uh, so far <laughs> terribly of of Trump as president. But they don't remember mm -hmm. a moment before we were all politically awake and active. So how do we make sure that we don't ever take that for granted that, you know, that we sort of train mm -hmm. them to, to always be awake and thinking about politics and acting and and doing this every day when they didn't have that shock to their system that that we experienced? That's a great question. I think that we need to lay the groundwork for this to be uh, incentivized it, 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 socially. So, like, I want I want this to be like a cultural shift. We all have to participate in this being a, a cultural shift where, like, being a good citizen is the same thing as being a good person. Like, a funny way I think to think about it is like it's totally a thing that that people would be like oh shit i don't watch um game of thrones and like that's getting awkward cuz like everyone at work won't shut up about game of thrones right <laughs> why is it higher value to know everything about game of thrones 
than local government, right? Like, and I'm, I'm kidding, and I'm totally a nerd, but how can we all be like, we need to be talking about this stuff, and we need to be talk. We, we can't pretend that we can't just talk about politics. It, it should be, I think it should be embarrassing. Let's make it embarrassing for people to be like, oh, I just don't know, or I just don't care, or I just, I just can't. That's not acceptable. I don't think, and and I say, and it, we've allowed that to be acceptable. Uh, and it, so a big, an ex, here's an exciting, I guess, way to consider it in terms of what's possible for demographic foundation that can be laid and was laid. So baby boomers um, did a lot of stuff around volunteering. You know, the, a really good example is the Points of Light initiative. But, you you know, you see it in high schools, especially in high school. Like I was, there was always like Habitat for Humanity or there's things like Teach for America. And there was always, you had to volunteer to be on National Honor Society. And it was highly, highly incentivized volunteering. And, and that, I think, is directly connected to a sense of altruism that, is characteristic of the millennial generation and Gen Z as well. There is a desire to do good, to leave the world a better place than we found it. It's it, it's echoed out through our uh, guiding cultural object, Harry Potter. There's this 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 heroic fight for equality, leave the world better than I found it. Social justice drive that characterizes millennials, and so that's been made the case through institutional. Uh, realities through structural situations that informed who we are um, as a generation. And so how can the current generation now, as we rise into leadership and shift the political order, um, lay the foundation for creating a culture that incentivizes constant participation? And I think that the, the, there's, a lot, there's a lot to be incentivized in it, because this is this, guess what? Civic education, civic activism has everything. It has a sense of personal purpose. You you say, okay, here's who I am. I'm moving through the world with intention. I'm doing good for my community. I feel connected to my community. And then that's the other thing. It has community. It has connection. Like we're also caught up off from each other, and it's so easy to get siloed and and fractured into our bubbles. It it it, it creates um, a sense of belonging and that that is really sorely missing. And I think there's so many exciting ways ways that we haven't even begun to think up yet that we can create create these situations where it's it's it's, it's the coolest thing you can do is be giving back. The coolest thing you can do is be excited and passionate um, about contributing to the collective. Lauren, is there anything else you wanted to make sure we talk about today? You know, that, I thank you for giving me so much space. I, <laughs> I, I feel like I filibustered your podcast here. Uh, we, we don't cut people <laughs> off like Tucker Carlson did. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, well, no, that's, that's basically a lot of it. Um, I guess I would say, you know, it's um, it's it's tough going, promoting this, promoting a book, and I'm you know, if you if this resonates with you, like listeners, I would really appreciate any any support that you can offer. I'm really I really believe in this thing, and yeah, you know, it's it's hard to push past um, a lot uh, the impeachment noise and just also like a lot of really awful treatment that I receive <laughs> from both far right trolls and my colleagues in New York media. You know, I it, being a young woman writing about politics is has become such a painfully obvious thing to experience. And the ways in which I am dismissed and derided um, are extremely painful. And I guess uh, I think it's clear that I'm doing serious, important work and that um, this is a journalistic effort to build equitable public power. And I take it seriously. And um, if you take it seriously, I hope you will raise your voice and support because I could use it. So that <laughs> and um yeah the book is how to start a revolution and um at lauren Duca on twitter.com if you use the health site <laughs> <laughs> and uh what uh, what are sort of the ages i mean obviously adults can and should read your book as well but like how how young would you say a, a reader could be and and read it i know we have uh, lots of listeners who have kids and so i want them to think about oh, you know awesome. who who should be reading the book as well yeah you know okay so my honestly goal is like get this in the hands of every student in the country. But yeah, I think it would be engaging even for like a, uh, even for a political, from a, for a political expert and like, even like a precocious 
seven-year-old? I mean, I think I don't, like, I think I could have been reading this when I was, like, my Hermione, even seven-year-old self, maybe with some help. There's definitely some high-level stuff in it, but I don't think it's, it's, I don't think it's inaccessible. I think it's, it's, I've written it to be very digestible and entertaining. And that's, that's really my goal, because I think that there's a lot of political writing that is super boring and super dry and I'm really trying to reach as many people as possible. So I think it is pretty, um, it, 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 uh, somebody with a functioning frontal cortex <laughs> could grasp it, as, and, and that's the goal. Um, so, yeah, ho- hopefully hopefully th- there will be, like, little kids running around with this. <laughs> so functional, uh, functional frontal cortex. So, like, Donald Trump couldn't digest it, but my 8-year-old no, probably not could. My, not my audience. Not my audience. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, I swear to God, like, is he, it's so, it's always so completely wild when he does something that's astoundingly dumb because you're just like, oh, oh, like not just evil, also completely incompetent. Like that's great. Good, great. <laughs> <laughs> really mind blowing. <laughs> Yes. All right. Well, on that happy note, <laughs> uh, Lauren, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for, for joining us today. I'm really excited about the book. And I, I, I think it's so great. I, you know, I, I feel like an, an elder statesman at this point at just 40, because the, the young people are, are doing so much that's so wonderful. And so I'm, I'm really glad that you've written this book and that we can be encouraging millennials and Gen Z to, to really get involved in politics since we've just uh, totally leaped over my generation of Gen X. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I think it's so cool that you are both making this podcast happen when you can. And I really appreciate the, your time today. So thank you for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for listening to Two Broads Talking Politics, part of the Dimcast Podcast Network. Our theme song is called Are You Listening? off of the album Elephant Shaped Trees by the band Immunuri, and we're using it with permission of the band. Our logo and other original artwork is by Matthew Wefflin and was created for use by this podcast. You can contact us at Two Broads Talking Politics at gmail.com or on Twitter or Facebook at Two Broads Talk. You can find all of our episodes at Two Broads Talking Politics.com or anywhere podcasts are found.